By the middle of February, it became evident to General MacArthur that the place for President Kazan was somewhere in the southern islands where he would be safe from Japanese capture and also where the air was better for him. Um, Kazan did not want to leave. He, he was just not, he, it was not, not in his uh, DNA to desert the Philippines. Um, but unfortunately, on February 9th, uh, they decided, no, this has to happen. So a ship called the Don Estevan was, had carried all of the Philippine treasury and took off from Mindoro. And the next day, uh, President um, Quezon and his family were, uh, were taken by a, uh, an American um, submarine and to, a, to Antique, which is just off the coast of Iloilo. And uh, they, <laughs> they, got, they no sooner got out of the submarine than, than the air conditioning failed. <laughs> so it was, I mean, it was horrific. And there was not, you know, what, what are you going to do with the president who is, has tuberculosis and you don't have any air? So what they did was, um, Valdez, a doc, doctor Valdez in this case, um, commandeered the refrigerator in the kitchen and they opened the door and the, they made ice water and they had the president and the first lady bathing themselves in ice water to bring their, their you know, their temperatures down. Uh, they had to get to uh, Iloy, uh, to Antigua by s sunrise, which was which they did. Uh, but before they left, I forgot to tell you this. Bef just before they left, MacArthur came to the, to the pier to see them off. My uncle saw him talking to President Kezon, and what Ke President Kezon did was he gave him, he gave MacArthur his signet ring, and he said, "When they find your body, I want them to know." You fought for the Philippines. <laughs> anyway, um, they they then they went on to uh, Bacolod on a, on a ship called the Don Esteban, and it was just a series of stop here for lunch, keep going, stop here for the night, keep going. I mean, they, they went to from uh, the Hacienda Rosario, which is the home of Letty and Manuel de Rosario, to Enrique Montilla's place, then to the place of Juan Ledesma, and fortunately, all these ascenderos had places big enough to keep the party, and which, for which Valdez was very happy. Uh, unfortunately, five uh, Japanese destroyers and two cruisers were, were seen just off the coast of Cebu, which is where their next stop was supposed to be. Um, the, and they were being moved by a ship called the Princess of Negros. They offloaded the treasury there, and they were, were going to go on the Princess of the Negros to Cebu. Unfortunately, the Princess of the Negros moved to another port, and the Japanese found it and put it out of, out of commission. So now Quezon is on the island of Negros with no way to get anywhere. Um, however, at, by this time, uh, MacArthur sent, sent a, a um, uh, wire and said, you have to leave the Philippines. You cannot stay. I'm, I am in, in, on my way to Australia, and I want you to join me. Well, this was just, President Kesson just was, he said, I'd rather be captured than leave my country. And <laughs> MacArthur said to him, you don't have a choice. Meet me in Australia. So they, their next move was to go to Mindanao. Now, President Kesson had never flown, and he was very, very nervous. They, they get in this little plane to fly to uh, uh, Misamis Oriental, and uh, he, he, said to, he says to the pilot, can you fly very low, please? <laughs> <laughs> the pilot said, well, well, I'll do my best, you know. <laughs> but he was, he was practically, he had his wife on one side and my uncle on the other, and he was holding their hands. He was very, very nervous, and it didn't get better. Even when they got to Australia, he, did, he wanted the railroad car. He didn't want to be up in the air. Um, in any case, they finally made it to Mindanao. Uh, to, their, their aim was to get to the Dalmati Plantation in Mindanao. And uh, they were from, Osamis, uh, from Misamis Occidental, they took a car and they drove to the middle of Mindanao 
And then from there, they drove to Del Monte, and they could only make 15 kilometers an hour because the roads were so bad. So they got to Del Monte about 3.30 in the morning, and everybody went, went to bed. They stayed three days, and at, at uh, um, they stayed for three days, and then uh, MacArthur sent three B-17s to pick them up and bring them to Darwin. It was a nine-hour flight. There was no, it was a military plane, so there was no comfort. And so this did not endear <laughs> President Keslin to the American Air Force. He just, he was not, ha he was not a happy camper. Uh, in the first plane that was piloted by Lieutenant Faulkner of the U.S. Air Force was the president, his family, Valdez, Major Nieto, who was the aide de camp, uh, to, uh, the aide de camp uh, to the president, and, uh, and Father Ortiz, his priest. And in the second plane, because of the worry of the succession, was the vice president, Osmania, and all of his party. It took them nine hours, and it was very cold and very bumpy, and the president was not happy. Uh, they, and he, he, I don't know if it was because of his tuberculosis or because of his anxiety, he had a terrible time breathing. And so they were, they were constantly worried about his health. And, uh, Valdez felt he was seeing him just deteriorate in front of his very eyes. Um, to make matters worse, the second plane disappeared. And that had, that had Osmania on it and, and his party. And they arrived in Darwin and, you know, looking over their shoulder, where's the other plane? Well, it wasn't there. So they sent out uh, exploratory uh, flights and they did find them and they were all all right, but they, were, they had landed in the desert. They were out of gas. So the, the party reunited, and th the trip then was made from there by, by train. He just said he didn't care how long it took him to get to Melbourne. He wasn't going up in the air again. And so he did. He, he, um, they, they went by train, and they were met in Melbourne by General MacArthur and Jean, uh, Mrs. MacArthur, and uh, all of his staff. So then, then it was, became a question of what to do next. Where, what should we do? The president is not well but where would he best serve the Philippines? And it was decided that the best thing to do was to have him go to Washington, D.C. to plead the case for Philippine freedom and uh, to, to get you know, the help that was, had been promised for months and that had never shown up to the Philippines. So he and, and the, 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 whole, the family were, were, uh, went aboard the, U, the SS uh, President Coolidge, which MacArthur assigned to them, and they arrived in San Francisco. And then from San Francisco to Washington, they took the train. And when they arrived in Washington, D.C., on the platform waiting for them was President Roosevelt and all his cabinet. It was, it was quite a moment. Um, it was, that was my one, one chance to meet the president. I was seven, and my mother wanted to see her brother, and so we, it was great for me because I got out of school and my, my mother, you know, I was traveling alone with her and life was good and I was going to see the president of the Philippines. Well, when we got there, we stayed at the Shoreham Hotel and then Uncle Basilio called us over and <laughs> my mother went in to see the president and she left me on a chair in the hall. <laughs> So, so I saw I saw this little tiny th you know the door open and I saw like that and that was it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it, Valdez continued lobbying in Washington for the Philippines, but by July of '44 it became evident that the president needed uh, needed to be moved. So they moved they moved him to Saranac Lake, which was known for care of tubercular people, and um, he was he was at that point deathly ill. Um, on July 9th, uh, Valdez arrived at Saranac Lake, where he remained until the president died on August 1st. Shortly after hearing mass on that day, he was informed that the, pres the president had suffered a hemoptysis? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But that was sort of the death knell, and four doctors tried to save him, but with his family around him and his faithful servant, Basilio Valdez, also by his side, the president of the Philippine Commonwealth took his last breath. Valdez's lifetime journey with the man was also over. 
While he waited to attend Kesselman's funeral and burial at Arlington National Cemetery, he excused himself from President Osmania and asked to be ordered back to his troops. This done, he hastened to join General MacArthur in Australia as MacArthur prepared for the start of the liberation of the Philippines. He thus was part of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. My dad was also a part of the, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. He was a quartermaster first class on a thing called a PC-1134, um, which was part of Al Admiral Halsey's armada. It was this little tiny ship here of, of the armada, but in any case, he was. he was. He was in the battle, my uncle was there also, and after it was over, the skipper of my father's ship was told to tie up to the uh, flagship. And he thought, what have I done? You know, and, and uh, he couldn't think, and he was trying to, and then when they got tied up to the flagship, they said, would Quartermaster First Class Howard T. Cattleberg please uh, come up on deck? Well, there was my uncle, Basilio, and he had, he had lunch with Admiral Halsey and my uncle Basilio and some other officers. <laughs> he said it was lovely to see his brother-in-law, but he said it wasn't worth the ribbing he took when he got back to his ship. He said they were merciless on him, you know. Or the, or there you were with the big brass, and here you are nothing, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I like the story because it tells a lot about my uncle, and it also tells a lot about my dad. He finally, Basilio Valdez, finally entered the city of Manila on February 6, 1945. On that date, he was, he was uh, reunited with his wife, Bombona, and his daughter, Nukai. It had been three long years of separation. Um, the, the thing he had to do on February 7th, 1945, was to identify the body of his brother and his nephew, who had the day before been beheaded, machine gunned, and then beheaded by the Japanese forces. Uh, there were many deaths in the family, and this, this uh, um, it sort of affected his happiness at being home. His last homage to his, uh, to his friend Manuel Quezon was when, in 1946, Quezon's body arrived back in the Philippines. The body had been disinterred at Arlington, placed aboard the USS Princeton, sailed across the Pacific back to Manila, where the president was buried at the Cemeterio del Norte. Uh, my uncle also served, which I forgot to put in here, on the trial of General Hama, and well, he was one of the judges. Once things returned to normal, or close to it, Valdez took off his uniform, reopened his clinic, he turned down an offer to, to run for the presidency of the Philippines, he helped build the Philippine Nat Veterans Hospital and Lourdes Hospital in Mandaluyong, he served on both of their boards and on the boards of Pepsi-Cola and China Bank, where he also served as medical officer. He was the head of the Philippine Cancer Society and worked effortlessly for the Tuberculosis Society. The Philippine government, in recognition of his service, named an administration building at Camp Aguinaldo after him, as well as a postage stamp in his honor. He lived the remainder of his, of his working life as a doctor right up to his death, enjoying his grandchildren, and leaving his nieces and nephews with the memory of, I hope I can say this, of a man whose whistle always accompanied his arrival, as did the scent of 4711 Cologne. His shoes, shined by himself, could be used as mirrors, and his clothing was bandbox fresh. But best of all, when you were with Uncle Basilio, you knew everything would be all right. He died on January 26, 1970, and was given a full military funeral. I think he would have enjoyed it. Uh, on May 12, 1962, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur paid his last visit to West Point. He spoke eloquently to the Corps of Cadets. He said, duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying point to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Those three words, duty, honor, country, define the life of Major Basilio J. Valdez, as do the words of his own grandchildren. In a book I wrote recently about my mother and her siblings, I asked each of the 10 siblings' grandchildren to write five words that best describe their Valdez grandparent. General Valdez's grandchildren wrote, handsome, distinguished, gentle, generous, successful. Thank you very much. Are we going to What? <laughs>